Good evening and welcome back to the Nobody Asked Me Guy show. Guys, wonderful show coming at you tonight. None other than, you know, I told you guys last time, I call her Dr. Dr. Winifred A. Winston, and she's been so kind as to come back and join us tonight, and we will share some information with you. But as you can see in her background, we see that beautiful book cover, Unchained. We will be talking about Unchained. We'll also be talking about autism and all of the different aspects of autism, and uh, we will have, as always, a very informative show. Just want you guys to know again that you can certainly come and FaceTime uh, Dr. Winifred Winston, uh, by choosing one of those cameras at the bottom, you can ask questions of her yourself, or if you choose to to write them in the box, and then I will share them for you. But listen, let's move to the show. Now, Dr. Winifred Winston, uh, I, I know that I know that that you haven't assumed that official. And now you see, I give you these. Mm -hmm. these quotes. You haven't assumed that official title yet, but the breadth of your information is nothing short of doctoral. <laughs> thank you, so, thank you. you. Listen guys, now Dr. Winston is an advocate. She's an educator, author, speaker, and business coach. Now she is also an administration, administrator of a special education school and founder of, this, of the Dyslexia uh, Association. Advocation, I should say. I always say association is stuck on the brain. Now, after working for a uh, public school district, and uh, going through the IEP process uh, with her daughter, uh, Winifred quickly realized African-American parents lacked access to accurate information about dyslexia interventions and instructional strategies. Let that sink in a moment, mm -hmm. access to. Now, as we continue to introduce uh, Winifred to you guys, now outside of her work, Winifred is a volunteer uh, with uh, state leader for dyslexia uh, grassroots organization and co-founder of their local advocacy and support group for parents and children in the Baltimore, Maryland area. Mm -hmm. Now, I do not want to give all of this because I want uh, Ms. Winston to hop in and, and share some more pieces of this with you, but I do okay. want to stop for a moment and say happy Kwanzaa and Merry Christmas. Uh, to all of you, this is going to be our last show for 2019, and we just want to make sure that we get that out there. Merry Christmas and Happy Kwanzaa. And we want you to know, and we'll talk to, about this at the end of the show, uh, we'll open up next year on January the 10th, and our guest will be none other than Attorney Darrell Washington. Now, some of you may know that name. Uh, if you remember the incident in Dallas, Texas, with Amber Geiger, the police officer uh, taking the life of Botham Jean. Well, Attorney Washington is the gentleman that uh, did the due diligence as the family's attorney, and we know this. So without further ado, we just want to, to, to set the program and to let you know that you are in for a ride. Good evening, and I'm going to call you doctor. I warned you about that. <laughs> All those people that went to school and did their thesis and dissertation and everything, they, mm -mm. I only let you say it, but I don't really accept it. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, listen, Winston, will you please, if you just share a little bit more with our audience about the, the advocacy organization itself sure. and uh, how it, okay. Yeah. So what happened was, um, my daughter was struggling to learn how to read. And so I was trying to access services and just really figure out what was going on. And I went to a lunch and learn um, where an attorney, a special education attorney was talking about the IEP process, which is the individual education plan. And a young lady, as we were leaving, she said, oh my gosh, you ask such good questions. Have you ever heard of decoding dyslexia? I was like, no, what's that? She was like, decoding dyslexia, Maryland, they have a chapter. You should, you should, you know, look them up. And I did. And it's a grassroots parents organization, parents, educators, related service providers, um, and those who really want to um, see that all children read. Um, they meet monthly. We have advocacy day in February and it was just life changing because through that organization, I was able to access information, accurate information, resources in order to help my daughter. So I just went head in, 
you know, just full throttle advocating, going to our capital in Annapolis, serving on a panel and just becoming very involved with the advocacy group, because I realized that while some of the things that I do don't help my daughter, but it helps children that come behind her. And as I'm advocating for her, I'm also helping children coming behind her. And what I realized is that parents didn't have access to the information and African-American parents. Um, you call me doctor. I do have a master's degree. I worked in education. I was a teacher. Um, I was an adjunct professor at the university level. I worked in K-12 and I didn't know how to access resources for my daughter. I didn't know. So that really was a pain point for me. And I said, I'm going to do my due diligence uh, to spread awareness and educate all parents, um, but focusing on African-American parents because it's hereditary. Doing away with, for those out there with diplomas that say doctor, mm -hmm. but staying with the fact that the information that you have to share is doctoral, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> if you mm -hmm. will, if, if you will share with us, I, I know that there are various uh, types of, of dyslexia and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I think, mm -hmm. as, as a matter of fact, I know when we talked the last time that you were here with us, is that you, you you shared so many diverse forms that many of our audience, of course, and I admit it, I didn't know either. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. if, if you will just kind of uh, revisit those a moment, I mean, I, sure. obviously you don't have to go through all of them, but yeah. if you kind of revisit that and share with us the different types and that situation sure. there. So dyslexia, we know, is neuro, um, neurological in origin. And it's when a person has trouble with identifying uh, sounds with letters, right? Um, so spelling is hard and decoding, which is sounding out words, is hard. That's reading. Um, the IDEA, that it would fall under category 09 under specific learning disability and reading. But then you also have for lack of a better term, this is not the official term, but for a lack of a better term, dyslexia in math, which is dyscalculia. And then you have dysgraphia, for a lack of a better term, dyslexia in written expression with writing. And it can show up in two ways, fine motor, where the handwriting is very sloppy, or written expression. How do you get those thoughts out of your head onto paper? So there's three different types, uh, reading, writing, and math. And then if you dig deeper, there are actually uh, about three or four different types of dyslexia. What they say is when you meet uh, one dyslexic, you've not met another the same, right? So every person with dyslexia is a little different. Although there are similarities, um, it's a difference in every every person because of what area the deficit is in and where they struggle. So it's very important that parents educate themselves and really find out what their child's strengths are and, and what the areas of weaknesses are, but to also focus on those strengths because building up that confidence is very important. I just met a young man um, at the barbershop where I go. And um, he heard me talking about dyslexia because I had the honor of going to Portland, Oregon last month to the International Dyslexia Association annual conference um, and all the experts were there. And he heard me talking about the trip to my barber. And so we walked out together and then he pulled me to the side and he said, hey, you know, I heard you talking about dyslexia. And I said, oh, yeah, my daughter is dyslexic. He was like, I think I am. I said, oh, really? Well, tell me about your early childhood, you know, your school days. He said, oh, I was in the special education class. You know, nobody ever told me I was dyslexic and, you know, my confidence really suffered. But, you know, once I got this barbershop open, I'm like, so what? I can't read as fast as anybody else. But this man um, is a father, is a grown man, is an entrepreneur. And when he was sharing with me that he lacked confidence, he still had a little bit of that in him. You know, because he said, you know, I, my mother used to just yell at me doing homework. And now I found myself doing the same thing to my daughter. And then I realized, wait a minute, she's struggling the same way I'm struggling. So he said he started doing his own research and Googling and watching YouTube videos. And he was like, I, I think I'm dyslexic. He um, reads books by audio books. And um, he said, you know, and I read a little slow, but had I known, had I known and gotten help earlier, he said, maybe I would be further along in life. And he's an entrepreneur 
and he has a CDL license and he told me some other credential he has and he told me about a nonprofit he wants to start and I started telling him some successful African American people who were dyslexic and he was like oh yeah I know Whoopi Goldberg Danny Glover you know um Octavia Spencer Mary J Blige you know he knew some of the same people because he had done his research but I think about you know that third grader that second grader you know that fourth grader how about that high schooler right that middle schooler who knew he couldn't read so it's just so important that parents do their due diligence and do their research and it's so important for me to keep spreading awareness and spreading the word so we don't continue to have stories like this where people are finding out as adults that I'm dyslexic and had no clue yeah so as you share that as as two educators how important would you say and I think I know the answer, but I want our audience to hear that. I keep watching my screens here and the thumbs are going up, et cetera. How important would you say your administrators understand what you are sharing? You know, because we talk about IEPs. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> we we <laughs> talk about IEPs and, and people many times as you are sharing mm -hmm. don't really have the knowledge. And, and if we dare say uh, our, our minority parents, uh, even two or three or four fold, However, when they go to various schools and the administration doesn't even understand it, and those that are, uh, uh, how, uh, I'm trying to say this nicely, uh, those that are supposed to be preparing mm -hmm. the IEPs for said child, however, they just try to write something up to, to end quickly, what advice would you give to the parents to, to challenge, if, if I can use that word? Yeah. administrator so, and teachers when it comes to that. That's why decoding dyslexia was so important. Now you call me doctor. I mean, I've got some parents that are double and triple doctors that will just run circles around me. And for no other reason than they had maybe multiple children with learning disabilities, right? And they had to hire an attorney and they had to go through this process multiple times. So an organization like Decoding Dyslexia, and we're in all 50 states, is so important because what we're trying to do now with our local uh, chapter here in Baltimore City is partner with the school district, right? Hit it at the local level. Each jurisdiction, each local school district is different. And we know that each school is different. We know that each IEP team is different. And it's all about collaboration and education. So you as the parent, you need to educate yourself, read books. What I want to say is stop going in Facebook groups asking questions. I need you to pick up a book and read it, read it to understand, then watch a YouTube video by an expert so you at least know what questions to ask and share information. I shared articles. Right. I even had the book with me at the IEP meeting and read out of the book and quote factual articles and research. Right. Because they're all about data and what's research based. And some of them of no fault of their own don't know because higher education institutions don't teach the science of reading. So we have several teachers that are, you know, a part of decoded dyslexia and they testify that I learned nothing about this in, in undergrad. You know, I came out to be a teacher and I didn't learn the science of reading. So it's about collaboration, education, and um, really advocating for your child, right? Like speak up, ask questions, but we are really trying to partner with our local school district. When I was in Portland, I ran into an organization where I know we purchased curriculum from them. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is, uh, it's called Wit and Wisdom. I said, well, how would this curriculum close the gap, right? And they're telling me Wilson, um, and I'm like, well, Wilson must be taught with fidelity, right? Now, these are teacher talk education words. What's fidelity? It must be taught in the way that the program was laid out for lack of to really simplify it. It must be taught. If it says step one, step two, step three, step four, it must be taught in that order. And what teachers are doing is picking out step one, picking out step three, or they haven't been certified and properly trained, right? I met the founders of the Wilson system. I spoke with the husband and the wife. They had a meet and greet. We were in there and I'm talking to the founder and I'm sharing my experience where I knew the teacher was not certified. She might have been trained, but she wasn't certified because what did I do before the IEP meeting? I called the 800 number. I gave her name. I gave her email address to see if she was on their list of certified and she was not. So the school district is saying we're going to use Wilson um, to close the gap with this wit and wisdom curriculum. 
So then I saw a presentation where a private school in Richmond, Virginia for dyslexics use wit and wisdom. And I said, I would love to come to your school to see how you're doing that because this is a private school for kids with dyslexia. They're using the same curriculum that my district just purchased. And I know that they're using some type of um, Orton Gillingham based structured literacy to, you know, help these dyslexic kids access that content, but also learn to read and move ahead. So I came back, I sent my follow-up emails and I said to them, I would love to connect with you, right? The regional people here in Baltimore city with this curriculum. And let's take a trip up to Virginia. We're in Maryland and see how this private school is doing it. Right. So offering solutions and offering to partner with them. And um, I'm not afraid to do that. I think I have a unique lens having been an administrator first and working with principals and having hard conversations with staff, having worked in HR, then going in the classroom as a teacher. After the fact, being a teacher, having a stack of IEPs. Can y'all see my hands? A stack of IEPs and not knowing how to help my students. Literally, yeah. like, what am I? How do I accommodate? Like, you know, having a lens like that and now being a parent. And all I could think of, my baby's not going to be in high school about to graduate reading on a third grade level. And I had students like that. So I say all that to say that, you know, parents have to feel empowered to ask questions, to research and advocate mm -hmm. for their child. Because I shared information with our IEP team that they didn't know. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just had to think of no fault of their own. I don't think anyone intentionally goes into education and say, I want to fail kids, right? Yeah. I don't think they do. But unfortunately, <clears throat> you know, the way systems are set up, the way school districts lack funding and money and resources, they don't have time to find the articles. So I did <laughs> and I shared them, yeah. And, that, and that's cool. Listen, allow me the opportunity to introduce Dre. Dre is an uh, uh, elementary hey, school Dre. teacher in New York. Hey, and uh, uh, Dre is for me. I, you guys may know one another already. And I've asked, I asked Dre to join us. I'm glad he's here. Yeah. It's good to see you, Dre. And uh, I just want to share with Dre, feel free to jump in and share. Uh, Any time uh, we were discussing uh, IEPs and, and, and what do you think parents need to know? And, and that's what uh, Winifred is sharing with us right now. So uh, feel free if you want to comment what she just well, finished, feel free I, to do that. I did want to um, uh, say real quick that parents um, sometimes aren't aware of the power they have when it comes to IEPs mm -hmm. and how um, IEPs is a, a committee of people which includes the parents. Yep. So it's not a teacher, the special education teacher that's coming in and telling the parent, this is what your child needs, so we need to do it, sign here, and that's that. Uh, in many cases, the, the parent is the expert in the, on the child. And, um, uh, some, and you're right, I, I, some teachers would just rush through IEPs just to get it done and it fails a student. Um, but the individual education plan is exactly that. Individual education plan, yep. which should be individualized. This is like the one thing that should not be cookie cutter mm -hmm. at all because students have various needs. And although it may be similar, in those similarities, there's uniqueness, mm -hmm. you know, so they can have a, a similar diagnosis. Not everything is going to work for each student with that same diagnosis. So parents, like, like you mentioned, which I have yet to have that a parents come to me with articles. I want, I wish that was the case where they say, you know, cause you know, like I, I so uh, truth be told, like I've been doing this now. Uh, this is my four, third year. Oh, wow. Teacher. And um, and when I started teaching, I was still in school, and uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm listening to you talk, and I'm like, "Hey, I was that teacher." Yeah. <laughs> and, and and now I find myself spending a lot of my time at home, uh, reading, researching, looking up YouTube videos on ways that I can help my students. And I, I remember there was a student that we had who had IEP, um, but I had challenges trying to get the school to consider. Uh, requesting um, evaluation for dyslexia mm -hmm. and for some I don't know maybe you have experience with this okay uh, like yeah districts, but. they don't want to say the word dyslexia because when they yeah. say the word dyslexia that's that's money and resources so you need mm -hmm. for example my daughter's IEP says she had a specific learning mm -hmm. disability in reading right mm -hmm. and I'm mm -hmm. like okay what is that what is that mm -hmm. yeah. so then mm -hmm. um, they didn't say dyslexia at the very end someone slipped up and said the word dyslexia so I said oh does she have dyslexia oh no 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 we didn't say that we can't 
We can't diagnose that. They cannot diagnose, but they can identify characteristics of. Yep. <laughs> so when I took the IEP home, I had my cousin look over it, who's an attorney who worked in special education uh, law. And then I had someone else I knew who, who was a special educator look over it. And it was 46 pages. Mm-hmm. And I know that her and my daughter attended a charter school. I know uh, I was on the board. This is nothing. I was on the board at her charter school. So, uh, you know, I had a great relationship with staff and I know that they had every intention to do well by my child. But the way that IEP was written was that anybody could work with her. And when I read it over and I read my book, right, and I started educating myself, I said, the way this is written and saying that anybody can work with her. And we know that that won't be sufficient because she's not making progress now. Mm-hmm. I said, I need mm-hmm. someone trained in structured literacy. They said, well, Miss Winston, we, we can't name a program. We, we don't put a program in there. I said, I'm not asking you to put a program. I said, I don't care if you put Wilson, Linda Moo Bell, Orton Gillingham. I need structured literacy because my research shows me that I grabbed my article and I start reading from it that this is what works for children with dyslexia. I said, now you're telling me specific learning disability. I said, but based on my research, my daughter has dyslexia. And this is what works for her. So what's missing in a lot of those IEPs are the correct interventions. Mm-hmm. It'll have accommodations. You can give my baby extra time all day long. If you don't teach her how to decode and read those words, mm-hmm. that's not doing anything for her. Yeah. So again- And a lot of times the management needs that, that they address in the IEPs usually um, address behavioral management needs. Yes. Or to keep them- Yeah, know, so- contained. Not really. So, and that's where, that's where things like OG- Yep. And other programs should be uh, input, like when it talks about the, the management needs of, and this is what parents need to understand. Every IEP has what's called a section that talks about management needs. And it sounds like, okay, what do we need to do to manage the student? Really, what it is, is what does the educators need to do to help provide specific needs for the student? Mm-hmm. It's not like, okay, what do we need to do to manage the student? It's what do we need to do to meet the student's particular needs yes yes it's it's the it could be the wording in it well i'm gonna be honest like even though i have like now i have all this knowledge i go back and i look at my daughter's iep and i'm like this is a hot mess this didn't change from this meeting to this meeting which i didn't notice because i didn't read it word for word and then the goals i could tell my friends i said these goals aren't right but i don't know how to tell them to make it right like, I don't know how to write smart goals. Right. Mm-hmm. But I know that th- what this is saying is not going to help her. Eighty percent, 70 percent. You know, like mm-hmm. I didn't really yeah, fully yeah, understand yeah. that. And what mm-hmm. I did, um, you know, I'm very transparent, like the barber, the, my, the guy in the barbershop. Like, you know, I'll talk about my daughter having dys- dyslexia and, you know, she'll hear me out. and be like, Oh, dyslexia again, mommy, I'm going to go wait in the car. But I talk about it and I'm not embarrassed and I'm not ashamed. I asked for help. I saw a woman mm-hmm. at a meeting. She seemed very knowledgeable. She was a nurse by trade. You know, so some of that brain sciencey stuff she caught on to very quickly and she mm-hmm. understood. I said, well, do you have time to meet me maybe in the library to go over my daughter's IEP with me before I have my next meeting? I didn't have money to pay an advocate at that time, but I sought out that parent who I could tell knew her stuff. And we met and she marked it up and explained it to me and gave me tips on how to say it. You know what I mean? Whereas other parents, nobody's going around saying, oh, my child has an IEP. My child has ADHD. My child has dyslexia. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But mm-hmm. when you don't know, you've got to swallow your pride and ask for help. And what I post mm-hmm. all the time is get comfortable with the uncomfortable. It was mm-hmm. very uncomfortable for me to talk about deficits in my child to strangers, essentially. Mm-hmm. Right. It was mm-hmm. very uncomfortable to read that 46 page document and not understand more than half of it. And then try to go back and fight for what my daughter needs. And I told them in the IEP and, meeting, I don't understand. Could you speak English? Explain it to thing. me. And here's the thing about IEPs. Um, and again, I had um, my I had two stu- my two kids with IEPs. My youngest son, who just got declassified, and my oldest son, who had who had an IEP throughout his whole school, right? And uh, this is before I was a teacher. And I would read this stuff and, and think to myself, I have no clue what I'm reading. Um, no clue. Um, but in my mind, I'm thinking, but the educators know what's best. Yep. Right. Um, and I would always, I would have conversations with, um, uh, the IP coordinator at my school, who's awesome, by the way. And, uh, I would ask, well, why are we using verbiage that is so academic and difficult for our parents to, to comprehend? Shouldn't we 
um, speak in terms that they're able to understand. We're using all these big words and they don't get it. Like we can't, we can't expect parents to understand, you know, teacher talk. And, That's what I call it too. And, and I, and I think that it's not fair. It's not fair because let's say the IEP it, it could, could also be implemented at home if parents can understand that as well. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. they, they, every parent has a copy of the IEP, right? They have the right to see it, um, question it, make changes. They have more powers than teachers have. Uh, but there are some uh, things that we can do together to partner up to make sure that the students' needs are met both at home and at school. And I think that um, it's intimidating for parents who... Very, very um, much so. Yeah, who who read it. And they're like, I'm just going to leave this to the teachers because, first off, it's already intimidating they're the to hear yeah, that your, your child Allegedly. needs an IEP and that they, they're in special education. Because a lot of parents don't want that stigma on their kids. They yep. think it's, it exists. Special education today is much different than it was when I was in school uh, 20 years ago. Yep. Right? So now, like, like have having kids declassified. Like my son is declassified. He's in the seventh grade. He no longer needs an IEP. Right? And it seems like schools today, at least in New York City, are trying to, to look for ways to declassify students, hopefully in the right way. Yeah. Um, but, but see, um, with, with proper interventions, what I tell parents is like with the dyslexia, the mm-hmm. the administration has to be on board with this child has dyslexia and how we're going to service them. But also, if they get the interventions that they need as they get older and as they master it, they may just need accommodations. Right. Mm-hmm. My daughter is always going to be dyslexic. And we recently well, in the same uh, evaluation, she's ADHD, but I, like so many other parents, didn't believe that. I'm like, oh, I have high energy. She has high energy. You know, we're alike. But then throughout this, I realized I'm ADHD. I never knew it. But as I'm reading up on it, I'm like, oh my gosh. And that that's why she does this. And that's why. So then you have the ADHD with the dyslexia. I was thankful though, we didn't identify ADHD first because what they would have said is, oh, she's inattentive. She's not focused. And that's why she's not learning to read. So I was happy to get Absolutely. dyslexia yeah, I was happy to get dyslexia first, but they all have to be on board. And if we get the interventions, right, <clears throat> they can mm-hmm. then get accommodations in high school, right? And then accommodations in college, which look differently. So once they learn the strategies and they understand how to read, then we can start implementing, you know, pulling back on some of those interventions. They may not need the tutoring, but the accommodations, like she's going to probably always need more time. She's probably always going to need to be by herself in a small, quiet environment to test, to be successful. You know what I mean? But the varying on the, the level of uh, d- the disability, some may need the IP the whole time, but some children, they can scale back and then get the 504 because they just need the accommodations. But that's why early intervention is so, so important. I have a parent right now. I put a nasty post on Facebook because I was just pissed off after talking to that entrepreneur. And then another parent keep waiting and seeing the little boy is either ADHD and dyslexic or ADHD. All the signs are there, all the stuff. I said, how about this? Just treat it like it is. Here's some resources. Here's some things you can do. Treat it like it is if you don't want to label him, but why not get the evaluation so you know exactly what's wrong? When the school yeah. came back to me and said, "Oh, let's let's do an evaluation," they were tiptoeing around it. I don't, you know, since you've done the SST process, and I said, "No, I've worked with kids with learning differences." No, no, no. I did my internship at Special Olympics North Carolina. Let's evaluate her so we can rule it out. You know, let's rule it out. I'm on board with and, it, but parents don't parents- want to do that. And, and parents, because they, they think once they evaluate it, they have to go through the process. Parents don't have to have any services that they don't want yep. for their kids. They, they, can, they can get evaluated and they can be uh, um, aut- autistic. And if the parents say, I don't want my child in a special class, they don't have to be in a special class. Yep. Yep. And this is what I always parents joke with my, I joke I, and I, say I, this a lot. I'm going to ask what, why you guys are talking, because I'm seeing these thumbs and hearts going up. Oh. I, I I have one one parent keep asking. Well, I'm sorry, her name is Sandifer. Uh, Ms. Sandifer keep asking, can you tell me uh, some signs of that may indicate that a child has uh, may be dyslexic? Sure. So, they, Ms. Sandifer, we got you. Yes. Yeah, so one telltale thing for me was my law. Lo- my daughter was not remembering sight words. Right. Sight words are the devil for dyslexics. They don't make any sense. You can't figure it out. You have to remember it. 
and um, memory, um, work and memory may be impacted. So let's say, for example, we have five spelling words and then um, we did the spelling test. She'd make a hundred. And then the next week we'd study five more because she was at a small private school before public. And it was like the first five she never learned. It was like we never went over them. And I said, what is going on? Now, my daughter was three saying defecate. Her vocabulary was off the charts. But remembering sight words and time, telling time. Oh, my gosh. She learned time mm -hmm. in kindergarten. And um, we I got a, a was it Sophia the first watch and everything. Her first grade teacher looked at me like I was crazy. I would have never believed that um, those concepts. She'll say next week. She's to this day, she's like, oh, mommy, we went last year. I'm like, no, that was two weeks ago, like, or yesterday. Um, if they have trouble remembering their alphabets, right? They can't get the alphabets down. Um, different things like that. Chime in, Dre, because it's multiple mm -hmm. things at different levels, you see. But when they're younger, remembering sight words, learning the alphabets. And, oh, this is what I learned in, in Portland. If they've had a speech deficit when they were before they started school, because speech is language and dyslexia is a language based learning difference. So when kids go through child fine and they get speech services after the speech services uh, are ended, it shouldn't stop. They should be reevaluated because they are at risk uh, for being a struggling reader if they had a speech deficit. Yeah. A lot of them will say, I got speech when I was younger, then I didn't get anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. I don't know. Uh, I'm not too knowledgeable about dyslexia. Mm -hmm still uh, doing research and learning about that. Um, but um, I, I, one, one thing I do know is it's the, the coding. Mm -hmm. Decoding. Very, so they'll yeah, sound out a word, right? My daughter yeah. could sound out the front of the word. She could sound out the end of the word, but she couldn't yeah. put it together, yeah. right? So that's that's one key sign. I'm like, well, you got the first part. You got the last part. Then she'll say some word that's not even, even close, remotely close to it. Um, spelling is horrific. Oh, gosh, I wish I could show you guys a you know, note she left because, me the other day. Because we're telling them to spell the way we want them to and read the way we want them to. Mm -hmm. And and that's the challenging part of, of um, the, the dyslexic diagnosis is because um, it's not that they can't or unable to. Um, they if, they if they were able to formulate their own language and their own um, writing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they can do it. They can, they can create their own um, writing. And they'll be able to do it because they code things. They, they decode differently than everybody else. So it's not like they're they're incapable of um, writing. They're yeah, and I want to make that clear. So most dyslexics have average to above average intelligence. It has nothing to do with intelligence. So a good example I like to give uh, parents is like we learn sight words through flashcards, right? Mm -hmm. Flashcards are the devil. Well, my daughter would learn sight words. We did it multi sensory. So we go. Um, went w e n t she tap it out on her arm went w e n t i would have her air write it w e n t yep. went w e n t what is your mouth doing okay. when you say went logan w e n t we would engage all the senses and going over sight words and we'd make it a game and i bought some kind of um clay stuff that she could take apart and make the words with but this helps plant it in her brain and remember it mm -hmm. um because that's what works. Those flashcards, that, that doesn't work for, for dyslexics at all. But go with your gut. If you feel like something is not right, you know, my daughter's my only child, you know, the first one. And everyone would say, oh, you're a first time mom. You're overthinking it. But I knew at pre-K at four, something just wasn't clicking because kids who left out of her preschool were reading and she wasn't. And I read to her every night. We read to her a lot. But she just wasn't catching on. Oh, by first grade, she's just going to take off. You watch, you'll see. She's going to take off. She didn't take off. So, you know, go with your gut. Research. There's a great website I like to refer parents to. It's called understood.org. And it has a plethora of practical, digestible, parent-friendly information. Yeah. That We have uh, Mrs. Mrs. Austin from Atlanta is asking, and I was writing it down, that's why you saw me keep putting my head down here. She's um, one of the other specific tests that will confirm or refute a person being dyslexic. Yes. So, um, oh, I don't, I, normally I have everything here. So there, you want to take a cognitive evaluation and then also the um, 
academic evaluation and with you're going to be testing for five areas in reading right so if you look at the science of reading there's five areas that we must tap into uh to be successful readers so those are the areas that you're going to want to have assessed and i can't remember them off the top of my head i never remember these things phenomic awareness i don't even know if i'm saying that one right um yeah see i don't even know how to say that <laughs> that's okay but look, can you imagine being at the table and they're spitting out all that mess? Yes. And you're yeah. like, explain that. What what mm -hmm. the phenome, pho what, phonics? Yeah, what are you yeah. saying? But yeah. there are five areas in reading. So you want a cognitive evaluation and you want the academic evaluation. Um, a speech language pathologist can do it. A, neuro a neurological uh, psychologist can do it. Now, here's the kicker. You, re you can request the independent educational evaluation from the school. Right. But you can also get one yourself. But there is a cost. It can cost anywhere from thirty five hundred to five thousand dollars for an independent educational evaluation. You can also ask that the school pay for one. But that is a process. Now, here's the kicker. If you go to a, um, a private practice, they're going to tell you straight off the bat. We um, don't accept insurance, so you need to pay. But if you go to a hospital like a pediatric hospital, they may accept um, medical insurance. So when my daughter was evaluated, she came back with dyslexia, ADHD, anxiety, and dysgraphia. Well, anxiety and ADHD are medical. Those are medical coded, like billing. And so therefore insurance may pick that up. And so I was, was covered at the pediatric hospital. OK, so um, that's why it's so important that you join a, a support group like Decoding Dyslexia. There's a branch in, in Atlanta and I will be in Atlanta in April for the Academy of Orton Gillingham annual conference. I'll be presenting with my uh, my attorney friend. We're going to talk about the eight steps in the IEP process. But when you join a support group like that in your er area, they'll tell you where you can go to get evaluations, where they've gone, uh, because we house that information because we've all been through it. Hmm. Wow. Now, now, you mentioned dysgraphia. Mm -hmm. Can you el elaborate on that just a little bit? Yes. So um, my daughter, hers is more fine motor skills. She's she's nine years old and she's about five feet one. <laughs> and so I just said she's long and lanky. You know, she's clumsy. You know, she's got to catch up to her body. But um, when we were at a small private school, they taught her cursive. So she didn't start out writing in print. So a lot of the telltale signs you see in dysgraphia or, or dyslexia, like reversals of B and D. We didn't see that. She's writing in cursive. You know, the B and D in cursive doesn't look anything alike. And so she was writing in cursive. So we didn't see the signs. But what you'll see with dysgraphia is that she they have issues with spacing words. Right. So you teach them to put one finger to move over to space like they'll just write it. And, and they don't move over. And the handwriting is illegible sometimes, very sloppy. I told her school, because I didn't know. I said, well, she's in public school. I said, well, she learned how to write in cursive. So her print's going to be a little sloppy because she's always written in cursive. And I can't get her to write in cursive now because she said, well, mommy, none of the other kids do. So when you see a very sloppy handwriting, um, when you see that they should be writing, should be able to write sentences, and they're just writing words like they can't get the thoughts out. They're not grasping the concept as they learn how to write. Um, that's when it comes into play. So sometimes it can be the fine motor skills, but you'll see the spacing is off. You'll see it very sloppy. And then sometimes kids just struggle to get the information from their head onto paper. You know, a lot of people struggle with writing. I know what I want to say, yeah. but I don't know how to say it. I can't yeah. get it out. It could yeah. it could be, you know, dysgraphia. It could be. And well, sometimes the doctors will say developmental coordination disorder, DCD. But if you dig enough, DCD and dysgraphia may not be the same, but it just depends. Wow. Listen, it, it's so much education here and so many thumbs are going up and so many hearts are going yeah. up. And I don't want to hold you all night. And it's the perfect segue uh, okay. as you, we talk about this graphia into your you being a best selling author in your book, Unchained. So Unchained if, me, can, Mama. Can, can, can we morph over to and talk a little bit about Unchained? OK, so it's it's actually so my daughter was identified in um, 2017 and um, I wanted to write a book. 
So here we go with this identification of dyslexia. And, and I mean, I'm sure you guys can tell just based on what I know, I've been in the thick of this, right? It, it kind of consumed me. I was falling asleep listening to webinars. And I mean, I'm just like, I got to get this information. I need to understand it because first I need to understand special education. Then I need to understand dyslexia along with my baby strengths. And then I need to understand um, the IEP process, right? And the science of reading. Anyway, so me and my daughter, I was just saying, you know, I, I talk to my daughter. I tell her when I'm not happy. You know, I, I try to explain what depression is. You know, I, I just talk to her. These are things my mom didn't share with me. And she said, well, mommy, you don't like this job. I said, no, it's really not working out. And well, mommy, you had your own business before. I said, I know, but I had to take a step back. And now I want to figure out what I want to do. She said, What's, what do you want to do? What's, what, what do you want to do? I said, well, I know I want to write a book. And she said, well, just write a book, mommy. And I said, well, OK. Right. And and then later okay. I, I paid a, a, I paid a book coach. And we never got the book off the ground. And lo and behold, in 2018, a sister that I never knew, we have the same father, found me on Ancestry.com. And so I say to her, I don't know if you know about this type of business, but I was a career consultant and I work one on one with clients and I don't want to do that. I want to go more um, virtual, you know, do some group and membership. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. And I want to write a book. And I recently paid this book coach. But, you know, I don't know. My sister was like um, at the time she was a four time best selling author. She's a now a six time bestselling author. She was like, I just quit my six figure job with Booz Allen and I'm full time entrepreneur and I do everything I said I wanted to do. My sister was doing. So um, we talk almost every day. We met. We have so much in common. There's like nine of us. And um, she was putting out producing two anthologies. And an anthology is a book collaboration with multiple authors around a certain topic. So one was fiercely speaking and how women use their voice, and then Unchain Me Mama, the forgiveness factor, right? So I was like, okay, I'll be in your anthology, fiercely speaking. I want to use my voice and speak about being sexually assaulted, right? And she's like, oh, okay. So then we're talking and just having a regular conversation, getting to know each other. And then um, the next day we talked, she said, I want to talk to you about something. She said, um, you know, whenever you talk about your mom, you know, I could... I could feel that there's something else. You know, I can sense that there's something else. And um, I think you should do Unchain Me Mama, the forgiveness factor. I was like, what? You use our personal conversation. Now you're spinning it into business. I'm like, I'm not, I don't, what? And the premise is, you know, the book is Unchain Me Mama, the forgiveness factor. Um, lessons learned on my journey to forgiveness. And so I thought about it and I said, okay, I'll do Unchain Me Mama. I'll talk about my journey to forgiveness. It was a pain point for me. And when I tell you guys it was a pain point for me, it was very hard because my mother is deceased and um, I was sexually assaulted by my brother. So um, of the nine siblings, this particular brother, he and I are the only two that share the same mother and father. So, and I was raised by my mother and he was raised by our father. So it's very hard for my mother because me and my mother doted on him. He's older than me. We doted on him because I didn't grow up with him. So whenever he gets to visit, I'm like, oh, my big brother. And my mother, this is a child. She didn't have custody of. So it was like her son, her son. He could do no wrong. One time we had a fight and he um, he hit me upside the head with two double D batteries. And I had the big double D battery print on my forehead and I got in trouble. <laughs> this is when we was little, you know, so. Fast forward when I was 18 and about to graduate high school, the sexual assault happened. And, you know, it was a part of me that understood she loves her children. Right. Like she loves her son. She loves her daughter. But then it was a part of me that said, look, you raised me. Like, why you don't have my back? You know, her her immediate response was, no, no, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I'm going to lose everything. How am I going to get him out of jail? I don't even think I got a hug that night. When I came back from the hospital without my mother to go get a rape kit done, I don't believe I got a hug. I don't believe anyone said it's going to be OK. Um, when I decided to write this story, I called my older sister from my mom and I said, look, I'm writing this story. You're going to be in it. But this is my story. This has nothing to do with 
with you per se. It's not about you. This is my story. And, um, you know, my sister told me nobody even realized what you were going through. We all had our own shit. That's what she basically said. Like, we didn't even realize how this impacted you. You went off to college on a, a college scholarship. You were um, female athlete of the of the week. You were featured in the local newspaper. Like, I was a little local celebrity in my town. You know, I just went back to school. But no one thought about how it impacted me. And I just had a lot of anger towards my mom. So um, the deadline for me to get my content submitted was my birthday, January 31st. And my birthdays are really hard because that's the holiday that I really um, it hits me that my mom is not here because if nobody knows your birthday, your mother does. And so um, I turned in my content on January 31st and I said, you know what, I'm going to tell this story because I think I can help other moms. And it gave me an opportunity to step away from dyslexia, right, to step away from all that advocacy and still do something for me um, to then move my second career phase and entrepreneurship journey forward with getting this story out. So I was able to collaborate uh, with my sister and, and talk about that in this in this book, Unchain Me, Mom of the Forgiveness Factor. Wow, that is that is so powerful. And, wow. And, and, and it, I know you see me always glancing up and doing stuff because yeah. I have another monitor here mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the thumbs up and the sad faces. And mm -hmm. wow, it's it's uh, uh, much love. As a matter of fact, uh, much, much love to you. And, uh, you know, just just let me say. For myself, that is very powerful. Yeah. And it takes a lot of courage to just mention things, because as we all know, unfortunately, things happen in our families. And many times people take it to the grave. Yeah. And what I and, and they are damaged forever. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, sadly, we do not address it. And we do not, as you stated, you are wondering and you're sharing with us mm -hmm. that you don't even think you got a hug. No. After you were violated. Yep. And okay. that's that's very. And yeah. see, my mom was born in 1936. They didn't talk about things like that. I was very vocal. Like when it happened, I called my dad. He hung up on me, told me I was lying. You know, I would talk to people about it. Uh, Ten years to the date of the assault, I did rape crisis volunteer work. I held victims' hands in the ER room and fussed at the doctors who kept us waiting for four to six hours. And then they would assign a new nurse who didn't know what the hell she was doing. And I'm like, no, scrape this way. And I'm, you know, they're um, being an advocate for that victim. And that was like closure for me. But I immediately understood. And I didn't want to accept it, um, especially when I was in college, because I was starting to suffer from PTSD and I would black out and I was afraid of losing my scholarship. And I was so focused. I was going to the 1996 Olympics. That, that was like a goal of mine. This was like 1993. And so when I started having these blackouts and um, like my friends start looking like my brother and um, just um uh, roommates would come back and say, oh, we hung out on Thursday night. We came back to your room. You were in a corner in a fetal position crying with the lights off. I have no recollection of it. Right? It was like, that's how we found you. I started getting angry, but I knew immediately that my mom was broken. And when, when someone is broken and they have not healed, they are not equipped to help you. I knew that immediately because my sister had been sexually assaulted multiple times and my sister succumbed to drugs and alcohol. She's still alive, but that got a hold of her because she never dealt with it. But she shared that when she first told my mom, my mom said, well, you're not the only one. You know, so I immediately knew that my mom was broken, but there was a part of me saying, I don't care about her being broken. I'm her daughter. I want her to be here for me. Um, but now as an adult, and, and I understand that broken people who have not healed, they cannot help. That's why it's a cycle. That's why it's like, well, my mother was abused by her husband. Now I'm in an abusive relationship. That's why it's a cycle, because when folks don't heal, they can't help. So I was determined when I had my daughter that I was going to get through this. First of all, he took the Olympics away from me. So I was like, he ain't going to keep taking stuff from me. So I was determined to break that cycle in my family. I speak out. I mean, people in my family still, you know, feel a certain way towards me because my brother was so loved and everything. But I'm like, it is what it is. This is what happened. It won't happen again. You know, we're not going to we're not going to say that Uncle so-and-so touched somebody and nobody's going to call Uncle so-and-so on it. And we're going to still have children around that person. That happens all the time in families. Right. We're we not does. doing that. We're we not it doing that. It does. 
Yeah, so I was animate. Like my mom never wanted to say he tried to rape me. She said he attacked me. I said, we're going to use that word because that's what it is. So I was very feisty, but I felt like I was all alone. Like I was all alone in that fight, but I love my mom. And I know that she loved me the best way she could with everything she had. But it took some time for me to forgive her and then to ultimately forgive myself. Um, I was a very angry, bitter child for a long time. And I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Dre said he teaches in Brooklyn. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And then we moved to uh, Rayford, North Carolina. So I was a, I was a New Yorker, you know, but but. The crack hit our family really hard in the 80s. So hmm. wow. You know, this man, man, please, please allow me to say, as Melvin Lars, <laughs> the nobody asked me guy. That's one of the reasons, not the assault specifically, but one of the reasons that I, I adhere to that title is because people don't don't talk to other individuals. We're not empathetic. We're not sympathetic. Mm -hmm. We just take it all as if, if if the person is not conducting themselves or acting the way we think they should, that they're just weird. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. because of our lack of empathy and sympathy for other human beings, and as you share that story, and it's not a story, as you share that, that part of your life and as you share your life, that is very, very huge. And please allow me to say to our audience, and I'm loving the fact of all these thumbs up, and 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 I just have to admit, I don't want to upset Winifred, but you know, a lot of sad faces are going up and that kind of thing, Winifred. And uh, you know, you know, it's, I, you know, I often think about my life and what happened, and um, you know, I grew up hard, like my all my siblings, except for maybe two, and my new sibling, you know. My mom had four children. Two were strung out on crack and alcohol. My brother was schizophrenic who, 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 who tried to rape me. So you have this schizophrenic who you didn't raise. And then you had me. I wasn't on drugs and alcohol, not a teen mom. Um, you know, being young, thinking, Ma, come on, let's just move away. You're a nurse. We own a home. Let's move away. It'll be fine. You know, angry, bitter. But it's made me who I am. You know, I was able to help families um, when I was doing rape crisis volunteer work. A 14 year old was assaulted and her mom and dad came and, and I have to pick. I can't talk to the child because she was 14. So I picked the father. Right. I was able to help that father. I know that through um, this journey, I know that I've helped several people before this book because I would talk about it um, as casually as someone on the television being assaulted and uh, and someone would say some stupid like oh well now she's oh she slept with all those men and i said well can you imagine being violated like that and never feeling like you have control i said so in order for you to gain control wouldn't you keep trying to do something so being promiscuous is not always being fast Right. Because I'm 40. I'm 40. Look, I had to think about how old I am. y'all. My birthday's next month. And, <laughs> and I still don't feel safe being intimate. And it's been okay. 20 plus years. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I know that I have helped people and I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. Um, this is something that happened for whatever reason. It was in the plan. You know, this is something that happened to me, but I don't want it to continue to happen to others. My brother was schizophrenic and we ignored the signs. We didn't know. But what some of the things that he was doing was not normal. But I'm like, oh, he's just quirky. You know, he's just country. That was my favorite line. I was like, oh, he country. You know, he grew up down south. He country. But we were ignoring the signs. And again, my mother being broke, she was a nurse. She had to know the signs. But by her herself being broken, you know, she just wasn't able to help. Now I know that my mother was taking Prozac. I didn't know what the hell Prozac was back then. She was depressed. You know, she was functionally depressed. She was going to work. She was managing bills. You know, she had a house. She was a single mom, but she was depressed. Like, I want to say long-term depression. I mean, shit, I'd be depressed if I had two kids that were strung out on drugs and alcohol and I'm working and our house was that house. I don't know if anybody from New York and you know that you got that house where the cops stay there. We call 911 and I start to say my address and they, they already know. That's how our house was popping. 
You I'm know? not laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing but because I, I of, make jokes. <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. Well, listen, it's wow. Wow. It, it's certainly been great having you here. Please, if you will, share with our audience how they might contact you, how they might get the book. Sure. Sure. You can find me on Facebook under Winifred A. Winston. Just type my name in there, Winifred A. Winston on Facebook. And to get an autographed copy of the book, you would go to www.winifred.unchainmemama.com. So you can see in the background, that's the cover of the book. Um, it's a, a I want to call it a tri trilogy because there's a one and this is two. One is pink. This is two. This is purple. And another one is coming out. But um, www.winifred.unchainmemama.com. And you can find me on Facebook under Winifred A. Winston. And please, if you have questions, I mean, you might not want to type it in the chat because it's uncomfortable. You don't know how to say it right. You don't want to you know, just say it, be transparent, just reach out to me. If you have a question about dyslexia, if you have a question about um, overcoming sexual assault, whatever it is, just ask me, inbox me, you know, um, don't worry about trying to dress it up. Just, just ask your question because oftentimes we don't get an opportunity to ask these questions and, and it may be brewing inside of us. And I will tell you from firsthand experience, these type of traumatic experiences don't go away. They rear their ugly head whenever they want to. You have no control. Oh, well, listen, Winifred, thank you so, so very much. Guys, this has been the Nobody Asked Me Guys show with none other than I have Dr. Winifred A. Winston. She's made it very clear that uh, once you get the official title, then I will have permission to do that. Listen, again, let me wish everybody a Merry Christmas, a Happy Kwanzaa, and share with you, this is the last episode for 2019. However, January 10th, put that on your calendar, we're gonna, we're gonna come back with a blockbuster. We're gonna have Attorney Darrell Washington. Those of you that were familiar and that are familiar with uh, Botham Jean and the Amber Geiger case, uh, where the Dallas police officer went into this gentleman's home and took his life, uh, Attorney Darrell Washington, is the attorney for that family, and we all know how the court case turned out. He will be here with us on January 10th at 7 p.m. So please tune in and uh, help us out, okay? Now, also, let me encourage you guys to go to YouTube and subscribe. You can subscribe to this page on YouTube. Now, last thing, Mothers and Their Smen, an introspective look at mothers rearing their sons is my latest publication, feel free to stuff that stocking and, and get that book. It's a very, very good book. Uh, you get autographed copies at www.dyingonmyfeet.com, www.dyingonmyfeet.com. If you'd like to have a verbal conversation, contact me, 440-935-0374. We're never too important to talk to people, 440-935-0374. So listen, have a great evening. And again, Merry Christmas, Feliz Navidad, Happy Kwanzaa, all of those great things. Again, Winifred A. Winston, you are a phenomenal, phenomenal individual. And we thank just you. like to say we thank you so very much. And we'd like to offer again our condolences in the loss of your mom. We thank want you, you to have a great and blessed evening. Happy New Year, everybody.